What's up, guys? So recently I had an opportunity to do something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and that is to take one car, specifically this in this case, our Turbo Coyote Mustang, to three different dynos and just compare the numbers. Leave the tune-up the same and see what it makes on three different dynos. The reason I've been wanting to do that is I dyno between 130 and 150 cars a year, and the question is always, why didn't it make more horsepower? Why didn't it make less horsepower? And I'm going to attempt to show you guys why you cannot compare dyno numbers between dynos and sometimes the same dyno between days just because of like weather station differences and how the dyno is being controlled at that specific shop. So the first dyno we're going to go to today is John Capizzi's Dino Jet. Check it out. All right, so 10 in the morning here over at Capizzi's getting this thing loaded up. So this is a Dynojet 248C with WinPEP 8 software. It is an inertia-only dyno, meaning that it calculates horsepower based on how quickly you're accelerating the mass of the roller itself. Notice a couple things about how his dyno set up. First of all, it's an elevated deal. You back on the hoist and back the car onto the dyno. Also, the orientation of the car, noticing that it is facing outside. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind just for a fresh air source kind of deal. But let's get this thing strapped down and make a couple hits. All right, guys, back over at my shop, Force Engineering. This is an MD150 all-wheel drive Mustang dyno. It has a linked belt system. There's a big belt that runs on the side of the dyno here. Once I get the car up and some straps set on it loosely, square the car, I unlink that belt to run the car in two-wheel drive. Obviously, this is a two-wheel drive vehicle. Notice the vehicle orientation, uh, specifically that it is not facing outside as it was at John, so we don't have as good of a fresh air source in this configuration as John does at his shop. It's just something noteworthy. This is an eddy current dyno. It does have a little bit of inertia. The rollers do have a mass that you are accelerating, but it's very minimal. So the majority of the load is applied via the eddy current brake. In the software here, I enter a vehicle weight and an aero load, and the dyno does its best to simulate the vehicle's acceleration rate in the rear world environment. Uh, so the pull duration here is different than it was on the dyno jet because the dyno jet, again, being just inertia, doesn't have a way to control the acceleration rate. Something noteworthy that I'll show you more about when we overlay the data logs. <laughs> guys before I get to the results I want to go over the data logs with you so I've pulled these logs from the two poles that were closest to the same boost level on the two different dynos uh, remember I mentioned the pole duration difference I wanted to show you that first and just to show you how I have these lined up I'm also logging race time you can see over here that we're within what a tenth hundredth a thousandth of a second and how close I have those lined up and that graph is down here you can see that they overlap each other uh, perfectly as they should so to show you this so this is from the Mustang Dyno check this out so that's the blue RPM line right so we got to uh, 8291 RPM at 10.8 seconds on the Dyno Jet Look at that RPM here is this one. We got to, let's see. Oh, we might want to use a little, uh, okay, 8248 RPM here you see in the dyno jet, so 50 RPM different. And it's 9.24 seconds different, right? So we're almost what, just about uh, like 1.6 seconds different in duration, which doesn't sound like much, but when you figure the whole pull is 10 seconds to nine seconds at somewhere around what 11 percent difference so that's something to just note noteworthy there a couple other things i have going on here for data 
Uh, manifold pressure on the Mustang dyno was a little bit different. So we're 17.5, 17.6. I actually overlay those over RPM in another graph. I'll show you in a second. And on the dyno jet, we're 17 pounds. So it makes roughly two tenths of a pound, three tenths of a pound to half a pound more boost on the Mustang dyno. Uh, now that is due to the PID control on the wastegate dome pressure. They were just a little bit different. This basically duplicates to that. They were half a pound different. So to show you more data here, uh, this is ignition timing. This here, DynoJet 1 ignition timing, 17.3 degrees at 8200 RPM. And on the Mustang dyno here, I'll pull that up, Mustang dyno hits. We go out here to similar RPM, oops, too far, 82.65, 17.2. So a tenth of a degree different. Another thing I added was a math channel on here because I thought that was interesting to show converter slip data. So check this out. So this one here is the Mustang dyno converter slip. You can see it's a little longer. Also noteworthy too is look at the calculation on the DynoJet one because when John was dynoing the car, he didn't put it in the clean neutral as I do. So you can see it stayed in gear and the slip goes down and you see here where I clicked it in the neutral and it goes way crazy. Anyway, uh, so noteworthy there that the converter lockup was extremely similar, like within half a percent of each other everywhere, even with the different load on the dyno. I don't really know what that means 100% other than to say it was probably noteworthy and somebody smarter than me could make better sense of what that means <laughs> as far as how the dyno applying load is affecting the converter lockup. Uh, so here we go. We look at intake temp. Just another thing that would be noteworthy. It was 74 degrees. Uh, it looks like 80 degrees peak, but at the end of the hit here where we actually care about it, on the dyno jet, it was 76 degrees. At the end of the pole on the Mustang dyno, it was 87 degrees. Now this is an air to water intercooler car. We were putting the same amount of ice in it every time. I do not have a way to monitor the water temp in the tank itself. So it could be that the water was a little warmer or it could also be that we were just getting a cooler air source on John's car. Now I feel like that's probably not the case and I'm sure that the water temp itself was a little bit different uh, there. So just some noteworthy stuff. So let's go check out the results here. All right, so this is an Excel. I had John send me some Excel stuff so I could overlay these by RPM in here, make our own graphs. So the DynoJet and horsepower and torque numbers are these two columns. The Mustang horsepower and torque numbers are these two columns. I already have here highlighted the peak number from the DynoJet. It was 883 horsepower, 618 foot-pounds of torque. At the same RPM on the Mustang Dyno, it was 809 horsepower, 568 pounds of torque. Check this out too. Same RPM, 16.9 pounds of boost on the DynoJet. 17.2 pounds of boost on the Mustang Dyno. So it made three tenths of a pound more boost, but it was down, you know, what, it was a 70 something horsepower, right? So if we go to look at the peak number on the Mustang Dyno, <clears throat> so it made a peak number here at 830 horsepower at 6,900 RPM, 17 degrees of timing, or I'm sorry, 17 degrees of timing, listen to me, 17 pounds of boost on the Dyno Jet, 17.5 pounds of boost on the Mustang Dyno. So the same RPM, it was half a pound of boost more, and it's 34 horsepower different at the same number. Now that's not the peak number in the Dyno Jet, so if you look peak to peak, you gotta compare uh, that value, the 830 value to the 883 value, so your 53 horsepower difference in peak, but I thought it was interesting that this showed at different RPM. Now, I think some of that is because the Mustang Dyno, again, is loads it differently, which means it comes into the converter at a different point. Uh, the thing is just going to spool differently. On John's Dyno, it's going to spool a little bit later via RPM because the engine is accelerating quicker for a given load value, where on my Dyno, it's excel the engine acceleration is a little bit slower, so it's going to come in the boost at a little bit sooner RPM, and the converter is going to be forced to couple a little bit differently, and I feel like that's why we're seeing this 600 RPM different in power peaks. Just something, again, something noteworthy. So over here, I overlaid two things. I'll show you that one in a second. So here's the dyno graphs overlaid themselves over RPM. You see the horsepower 
torque values over here, obviously RPM on the bottom, the higher numbers there being from the dyno jet, the lower numbers being from the Mustang dyno. You can see the curve is quite a bit different here. Like on the dyno jet, it holds it up quite a bit longer, right? The curve just looks smoother up top. It looks happier up there. On the Mustang dyno, you see it's lower. Now this thing's a little conservative on timing and I can see that more in the Mustang dyno because of the lack of the inertia. I believe that the big roller kind of soaks some of that up so it's not as sensitive. Um, anyway, that's the difference in the graphs. All right, so here's the visual of the boost curves overlaid each other over RPM, just so you guys can see this a little bit better than you can in the Haltech data because that one was over time. Um, but to give you an idea here, so the blue line is the dyno jet, the orange line is the Mustang dyno. You can see the differences in how the dynos apply load and how that affects when the engine is building boost. Just in the dyno jet, it's a constant source, whatever that roller mass is. And in the Mustang dyno, it's trying to simulate vehicle acceleration rate as close to the real world as possible, which is why these look a little bit different. Just an interesting note. Uh, for what we're doing, it doesn't really matter because we're just looking at the power differences up top. And you can see here, it shows us just what we saw in the data log, that it's three, like two tenths to half a pound more on the Mustang dyno than it was on the dyno jet. The curves mimic each other relatively close, other than the total values are offset a touch. I just felt like this was a better visual, visualization for you guys. If I could learn how to talk, that would be helpful sometime today. All right, so what does all of that information mean? Which of those numbers is real? Which of those numbers isn't real? Like, what can we really gain from that? The answer to the real or not real question is, honestly, it doesn't really matter. They're a reference point, right? Dynamometers are a tool intended to allow you to show improvements or losses, depending on what you're doing, for the changes you've made to your vehicle, and that's the point of them. If you want to calculate an actual horsepower number, look at, say, fuel flow through the fuel system or total mass fuel flow induced and do a calculation based on that or go to the track, see what the car mile an hour is in the quarter mile. There's a bunch of calculators out there and those things vary vastly. I did a couple on this one the other day just to try to get a reference. One of them said it was 1800 wheel horsepower. The other one said it was 1100 wheel horsepower. So there's just crazy calculation differences. The basic data to pull away from this, or the basic thing to learn from this process is comparing dyno numbers isn't something you can do specifically between dyno manufacturers, but even internally between dyno manufacturers, I will show you why that is in another video later. I also did a comparison on the, my Mustang Dyno to a Dynocom that I have yet to make a video for, so check that out. And remember guys, Dynos are tools.